Welcome to the Philanthropeneur Show, hosted by Dr. Victoria Boyd, designed to offer tips, strategies, and insights to empower nonprofits and entrepreneurs with sustainable win-win solutions. The Philanthropeneur Show is sponsored by the Philanthropeneur Foundation, building capacity through education and professional services. Well, welcome. This is your host, Dr. Victoria Boyd, President and Founder of the Philanthropeneur Foundation and Executive Editor of the Philanthropeneur Journal. And as usual, I am so thrilled to present this first show in our new format. You know, so we have a lot of goals here. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to share and maybe clarify what drives us to do the work that we do here at the Philanthropeneur Foundation. Our mission to build capacity through education and professional Professional service is the compass for everything we do to support and guide efforts to, to be effective and efficient as entrepreneurs and nonprofits, to demonstrate and explain the benefits of infusing social enterprise concepts into both for profit and nonprofit platforms. You know, we feel it's really important to provide access to fellow philanthropeneurs, the thought leaders, and visionaries that come loaded with trip, tips, strategies and insight so needed to grow strong communities on, on many, many levels. This radio show and our publications, the Philanthropeneur Journal and blog, extends globally as the resource of educational content with numerous topics, ranging from management to marketing, legal to leadership, all grounded in a philanthropeneur model. Through professional services, training programs, and mentoring, we provide hands-on support to guide the vision and process on a path to become purpose-driven and profitable. To create impact by being the resource in understanding the value, concepts, and principles that drive the need to be social enterprise businesses and nonprofits. So with that said, that's our goal. But our guest today is a thought leader and visionary. He has been an inspiration in helping me find the why of what the philanthropeneur does. And as I mentioned in the feature article that's coming up in the spring edition of the journal, his theory made my vision going from being just disjointed to connected and from being abstract to really being concrete. More important, what we will be discussing today for all entrepreneurs, nonprofits, big business, or small mom-and-pop companies, you need to understand and use this theory. Our guest today is Michael R. Drew, co-author of the book Pendulum, and a maverick who has become the world's most successful book promoter, having launched 82, yes, that's 82, consecutive books into the bestseller list, <laughs> many of them claiming the number one title. He found that a benefit of working with authors was gaining from their insights into social trends. He observed up close the shifting dynamics of society and saw firsthand the rapid and long-term changes in the publishing industry and how content reaches today's varied audience. This prompted him to found Promote a Book which helps writers and authors, thought leaders, speakers, and entrepreneurs build upon the essential components of continuing success with a platform for their writing and message, expanding their audience as they adapt to social shifts. Michael, welcome to the show. Before we get into our important topic today, please tell our listeners more about your background and how you got to be where you are today. Well, thanks. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I know this is the second time you've had me on the show, and I'm really honored to be here again. And, and uh, thank you so much also for the, the work in the, the magazine as well. I'm truly excited to, to be here today. Um, you know, I, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, I turned 36 back in January, and I've been in publishing almost my entire adult uh, life and career. I started in publishing when I was 18 and a half. I started wow. uh, actually, I'm a it's interesting. I'm actually a high school dropout, and um, <laughs> I got married at the age of the ripe old age of 18. And uh, my now ex-wife, but my wife at the time said I was managing a Burger King, and, and my wife at the time said I was too smart to manage a Burger King, so I had to 
get a job uh, doing something else. And so she um, worked with me and I found a job at a company in South Provo, Utah called Executive Excellence, which um, at the time was a division of the Covey Leadership Center. This is back in 99. Uh, before it merged with Franklin Covey, uh, or okay. before it merged with Franklin, became Franklin Covey, right? And um, mm-hmm. we were selling, I came in as a salesperson selling their magazine, uh, Executive Excellence. I became the number three salesperson within the organization within three months. And that's only significant because the number one and two and then four and five salespeople had been there for five plus years and were simply renewing subscriptions. So I came in and generated new revenue for the company. And so... <clears throat> Uh, within um, uh, three or four months after that, the merger between Franklin and Covey uh, occurred, and Ken Shelton, who was the executive editor of the magazine, was given the magazine by Stephen R. Covey. Now, Ken, Ken states, and I can't uh, prove this one way or the other, but Ken states that the um, that he was given the magazine as payment for ghostwriting Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And so uh, Ken came to me and he said, hey, Mike, we publish all of these great business authors in our magazine. Why don't we start publishing their books? And as a young 18 and a half year old, I'm like, yeah, we can do that. I can do whatever I <laughs> set out to do. And that's what I did. And, you know, I failed miserably for a year, but I learned a lot about book publishing and I impressed some fairly important people in the industry. And uh, those people um, recommended me to a publisher out of Austin, Texas, who had just come off of a huge success with the book, not Southwest Airlines' Crazy Recipe for Success. And they were looking for someone to come in and, and ha- handle marketing and PR. And uh, the name of that publishing company is Bard Press, B-A-R-D mm-hmm. Press. And um, Ray uh, Bard, who's the founder of the company, brought me in, interviewed me, and hired me. And the first day on the job, Ray said to me, Michael, we publish business authors. What our authors want more than anything else in the world is to be a New York Times bestselling author. What I want you to do is go figure out how the New York Times bestsellers works. So as a young, um, naive 19 and a half year old, I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And that's what I set out to do. And I, the very first book I worked on was by a gentleman by the name of Roy H. Williams. He's known as the Wizard of Ads. He owns the fourth largest ad agency in North America for buying radio advertising. He's a real legend in marketing and advertising as an example. Um, He's exceptionally well-known in the diamond industry. There are 20,000 sellers of diamonds in North America, and he has 46 clients. Well, those 46 clients represent just a little bit less than 40% of all diamonds sold in North America. So he's, I mean... He's a real legend, and I I got the opportunity to work with him on his book, Secret Formulas of the Wizard of Ads. And I launched that book to number three on the New York Times and number one on the Wall Street Journal. Um, And that started my endeavor in understanding and figuring out how the bestseller list works. Now, um, what I found out very quickly in publishing was that to successfully promote a nonfiction book, it's never about the book. It's about the author's goals and objectives, and ultimately it's about the author's platform. And so I became not only a student of publishing and, and, um, and, and how to promote a book, but also a student of what a thought leadership platform is and how to build and grow one. And again, what I realized very early in my career is it's not about the book, it's about the growth and the building of the author's marketing platform. And yeah. I was a publisher for five years, um, I worked for three and a half years uh, for Bard for Bard Press a year at Longstreet Press and as the, the co-publisher over at Entrepreneur Press, a division of Entre- Entrepreneur Magazine, for a year um, before I got the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit and left and started my own company, uh, Promote a Book, as you mentioned earlier. Um, w- when I left being a publisher, I had 19 New York New York Times bestsellers. Today, I actually I. I know that the information we, we gave you was 82. It's actually up to 83. I just put bold nope. All the right. book by Peter Diamandis on the New York Times in the last couple of weeks. So um, we're up to 83 consecutive books on the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and New York Times bestsellers list. Um, but what, again, I, you know, I own the largest, most successful um, book publishing company in the industry. And Roy Williams, the Wizard of Ads, quickly um, became my mentor after I helped 
helped him become a New York Times bestseller, and we became really close friends. And he, again, owns the fourth largest ad agency. So a few years ago, Roy and I wanted to get, figure out how to give our clients a competitive advantage. And how do you give your clients a competitive advantage? Well, if we can um, predict what their customers want before they know they want it, or if we can predict what the customers want before their competitors know they want it, then uh, we can give our clients a competitive advantage. How do you do that? Well, you have to be able to predict the future. Now, Roy Williams is one of the most brilliant men, if not the most brilliant man that I've ever met in my life. Um, he does something called the conciliatory of induction, which is to be able to see um, dis- uh, disparate industries and ideas and see how they actually, in fact, connect uh, and support each other. Um, as an example, um, there's something in science called third gravitating bodies. This applies in both the theory of relativity and in quantum mechanics. And basically what it says is that in order to have life, you need to have three gravitating bodies. So an example in relativity, uh, uh, for life to exist on this planet, there are three gravitational bodies. There's the sun, the earth, and of course the moon. And if you get rid of any one of those uh, gravitational bodies, there is no life on Earth. Obviously, without the Earth, there's no, there's no life. Without the sun, there's no life. And truly, without the moon, there would be no tides, there would be no weather, there would be no seasons, there would be no growth on this planet. And so you need three, gravi- three gravitational bodies to have life. Additionally, um, in quantum mechanics, you look at the, uh, the, the nucleus of, a, of an atom, which creates the stability of an atom. And so you've got neutrons, protons, and electrons. And you must have all three in order to have the balance of the atom so that the atom doesn't simply fly apart. They are gravitational bodies that work together. So third gravitational bodies is something that's, that's real in science um, and, and that we see in, in, in the universe around us. So Roy asked, well, if that's true in science, why is that not true in human communication? So what he did is he went... And he, he said, there has to be, in all effective communication, three gravitational bodies, three unique elements that cannot be condensed or combined into two or less. Our brains are always attempting to condense um, things into two or less items because it, it's, we, we really aren't designed to think about really more than one or two things at a time. Um, mm-hmm. As an example, if you listen to a symphony, um, try to pick out and hear more than one instrument at a time. You can hear the melody and the harmony. You might be able to pick out two instruments, but trying to hold a third instrument uniquely in your head while holding the first two is almost impossible. Your brain wants to condense things into t- into two right. or less elements. Right. So, and that's why um, when you listen to music, you hear it differently each time. Yep, and it's because you're hearing a different a, a different element of it. So. Right. What Roy said is if you want to be an effective copywriter, you have to surprise Broca's area of the brain. Broca's area of the brain is the part of the brain which looks for that which is predictable. If it's predictable, then it, then the message won't get through um, that protector of the mind and, um, and attention. Well, the interesting thing about third gravitational bodies is if you can create ad copy that has three gravitational bodies – then it will surprise Broca's area of the brain and you will have the attention of your customer. Right? So that's, that's who Roy is. He looks at, at really complex things and he, and he sees the connection and then he ties it back to the practical use of, of um, communication and marketing and business. So uh, anyway, Roy's one of the most brilliant people that I noted and when addre- looking at how, how to address the question of how do we predict the future, um, one of the things we have to note is that marketing versus selling is done in non-intimate environments. Uh, this conversation you and I are having is an intimate experience for you or, you or I, but it mm-hmm. is a non-intimate environment for your listeners because they don't, right. while they can ask you questions and engage with you to a point, they're not really able to have a multi-dimensional conversation like you and I are having. So they're having a, a non-intimate experience while you and I are having an intimate experience, one-to-one. The experience that the audience is having is, is a one or you and I too to many experience. So what we noted is that if we're looking at marketing and advertising, we have to look at 
cultural movements. We have to look at the, at what happens not with in, with the individual necessary, but within culture and society uh, as a yes. whole. And so um, we looked at chaos theory, and chaos theory states that that there are patterns larger than what the left hemisphere of the brain of a human being can comprehend. In fact, it wasn't until we had supercomputing in the 1980s that we were able to really start mapping out chaotic systems. You know, the the ocean is a, a chaotic system. There's a, a poem by Robert Frost that, that discusses our um, attraction to the ocean. And if I remember, remember right, it goes, the people along the sand all turn and look one way. They turn their back on the land and stare at the sea all day. As long as it takes to pass, the ship keeps raising its full. The wetter ground like glass reflects a silent goal. Now, the land may vary more, but whatever the case may be, the water comes to the shore and the people stare at the sea. Now, they cannot look at far and they cannot look in deep, but when was that ever bar to any watch of the keep? The reason why human beings are attracted to the ocean is, uh, is part of chaos theory. It's because there is a pattern, a literal pattern that can be mapped out that is occurring in the ocean. And the, and the right hemisphere of the human brain can comprehend that and sort of see this pattern that's occurring in the ocean. But the left hemisphere of the brain says, well, that's too much information for me to process. It's too much data. If I allow the brain to process that, um, the brain and body will, will literally, literally melt. So the left brain doesn't allow you to see that pattern. And so um, you're attracted to the ocean because of this conflict ongoing between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. So when we looked at trying to answer this cultural and, and, and marketing question, um, we needed to be able to see the bigger picture. We needed to, to step back and see what the chaotic system of society is. And we noted that uh, Blackie Sherrod, the famous sports writer from the Chicago Tribune, stated the reason history must repeat itself is because we pay so little attention to it the first time. And King David <laughs> said in the book of Solomon, the thing that has been is that which is that which shall be, and that which shall be is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything more of it may be said? See, this is new. It has already been of old time, which was before us. So with, with Solomon's words ringing in our ears, Roy and I set set out to predict the future by looking at the past. And we went back and researched the last 3,000 years, both empirical, uh, uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively, the last 3,000 years looking for a pattern. And indeed, we did find a pattern. We found that human beings are not the unique snowflakes that we would like to pretend that we are, that we do culturally um, repeat the same patterns over and over and over and over again. And so that, that gave us a model for being able to predict the future uh, as it applies to marketing and how we communicate in one cycle versus another. The two cycles that we found was a cycle of me about the individual and a cycle about we, the community. In a me cycle, it's about um, being bigger, better than who you are. It's about push in marketing. It's about seduction. In a we yes. cycle, it's about pull. In a we cycle, it's not about seduction. It's about intimacy. In a me cycle, it's about sales. In a we cycle, it's about, it's about building community, if that makes right. sense. And so based Absolutely. upon understanding the cycles, there's certainly cultural issues that go along with that. But based on understanding the cycles, we are able to adjust and change how our clients communicate and market to their audiences. And, and the book that came out from that was is called The Pendulum, which is a representation of how the we and me cycle go through these different cycles. Uh, I, I want every all of my listeners to go out there and get your book because I find it's fascinating. Uh, and, and you called it The Pendulum Theory. So we're going to talk more about the we cycle and directly how it impacts how a business or nonprofit should 
approach their marketing message and really all of the phases of uh, their platform. You created a, a really powerful analogy from Desmond Morris's 12 Steps to Intimacy process. Uh, his research really was investigating why married couples stay together. together. However, you've been able to succinctly create alignment <clears throat> with what is required in today's we cycle uh, for marketing and attracting relationships for customers and things. And, and really, I love the phrase raw, real, and revel relevant that you use. So we're, let's just go through the 12 steps. And what I'll do is I'll give you Morris's <clears throat> first and second you know, statement, and then you just sort of help us understand how the we cycle applies to that um, and I think that it is just well, so, and, 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 for us. and I think I think it would behoove your audience to know why why we why we why Desmond Morris's work is important. Um, the work the work in Pendulum that we did was mapping out psychological trends. Human beings change at an agricultural rate, meaning we we if someone has an epiphany and they change their opinion on something, almost mm -hmm. never is it in the moment. Almost always it's a culmination of days, weeks, months, or years of new information until that party has enough information to support, ch that person has enough information to change their opinion. When someone is going through grief, it takes a minimum of three years, truly. If someone dies in your family, it takes three years for you to return to something close to where you were before, even if it doesn't seem like an immense amount of grief. It just takes three years for you to psychologically heal from that. So, uh, and it can take up to seven, um, but the, the minimum is uh, three years for real healing to occur. So human beings move at an at at a agricultural rate, and we are psychological beings. And there's a lot of complexity to our psychology, but we're all, there's also some simplicity to it as well. And what, what occurred was that um, there was a question in, uh, in the scientific world um, as to whether human beings um, are pair bonded or promiscuous as a primate. In the world of primates, um, even if you're Christian, just the, 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 the general uh, species that we fit into is, 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 is primate, or the genus, rather, is the, is the primate uh, genus. Um, Within that genus, there, the uh, primates range from the bonobos, who will you know be promiscuous and sleep with anyone. There's no no such thing as pair bonded relationships, all the way through the chimps and, and gorillas who have have one mate for life. And so, um, and the how pair bonded or promiscuous the the primate species is is based upon the size of the male testicles of that species. Uh, to its body, and Homo sapiens as a primate, uh, the, uh, the males of the species are smack in the, in the middle. So there was a real question as to whether or not we were pair bonded or promiscuous. And so um, Desmond Morris looked uh, went out. Uh, he was a clinical researcher, and he went out and he researched Homo sapiens as a animal in the wild, and and watched us, and and really heavily researched. And what he found is that homo sapiens prefer to have the security and safety of a pair bonded relationship. They may want to, you know, be promiscuous beyond that, but the psychological security of the pair bonded relationship is what is required or, or desired by most uh, homo sapien primates. And so um, what he then did is he said, okay, well, if that's true, what, what dictates Within Homo sapiens, where you get long, what, what dictates a long term versus a short term relationship? Because obviously, you can look all around us. You have people who've been together for eight years and know people that stay together, get together for two weeks and break up. So, what dictates a long term versus a short term relationship? Um, and what he found is that at the foundational level of a relationship, that there are 12 fundamental steps. That the two that the two parties must go through in order to create the proper psychological conditioning to have a long term relationship, and that if the two parties skipped more than one of those twelve steps, so any two steps, step three and four, four and nine, 
uh, 10, 11, it doesn't matter what they were, that if you skipped more than one step, the, the psychological damage to both parties would be so strong that it would result in the, the, the same equivalent of having a one-night stand. Literally, it, it, you could skip steps three and four at the very beginning, and the psychological damage of both parties is the same as having a one-night stand. And so... Wow. Um, so what what he said, what they found was that uh, for and why they applied to marriage counseling if uh which is often the case that the problems that occur in a long term relationship where more than one step was skipped is based upon that the additional steps that were skipped and therefore the core healing that has to occur has to be directly driven back to those steps that were skipped if that makes sense. And so that they, they started applying it in that capacity to uh, marriage counseling. Now, again, pendulum is a psychological trending uh, model. Um, and so the applicability to, uh, to the 12 steps, is, it, it makes perfect sense. We, mm-hmm. Roy and I, noted that different forms of marketing and advertising stopped working or worked far less well as we transition from the me to the we cycle. And it required that we go out and find a new model for marketing. Now, how we came up with 12 steps was based upon basic business topology, um, you know, which is to, to look at industries other than your own for a solution. If you have a problem in an industry that is systemic industry-wide, you don't look in the industry for the solution. You look out of the industry at other similar industries or industries that have similar types of problems to find the solution. And, uh, you know, uh, Henry Ford uh, is attributed as creating the um, assembly line. But really what he did is he inversed or reversed what, um, what butchers have done for centuries. Because if you've ever been to a, a meatpacking plant, um, what, they did, what they do is they'll hang the pig or the, the cow on a, a hook and they'll send it down a line, and you'll have a different butcher who gets off one piece of, of, the, of the animal, one at a time. And when Ford saw that, he said, oh, well, instead of cutting a piece off, we'll add one piece of the car together that created the, the, uh, the assembly line, um, although it was really done for centuries by meat packers. Um, and so we said, well, we can't look in marketing for the solution to these problems that, that are existing here in marketing and advertising. We have to look outside. And, and it, what we believe to be true is that whether you, you are building a pair-bonded relationship with your significant other or you're building a relationship with your customer, that the psychology of the human being is, is exactly the same. So we needed to find a system uh, that specialized in building relationship. And, of course, uh, in terms of human psychology, uh, human psychology and marriage counseling has done more research on that than anyone else. And so that's where it, how we led into the research uh, for the 12 steps of intimacy. And to your point from a, a moment ago, what we did is we said, well, again, humans are humans. The 12 steps apply in building an interpersonal relationship. They must, therefore, apply in building a long-term relationship with our cust- with our clients' customers. And so what we did is we, uh, we applied those same 12 steps to business. Um, now, I think you, you, you wanted to list out a couple of them? Well, yeah, we're just uh, sort of just going to go through. I, I really want to encourage listeners to, to go and, and actually get your book and then listen to the whole program because – but I, if we can just – uh, wet their interests uh, with how they should be looking at their things. I think that would help. So let, let's just do the, the first few, because uh, the first step is eye to body. So in the we cycle, how would that application be for business? Well, and this would be true in a, in a me cycle as well. But it's it's what, what we're doing here is replacing um, push marketing tactics that um, are about sales and replacing them with tactics to build intimacy and relationship with your customer. You know, what, what, what happened in the me cycle is that the, the gurus and the salespeople got so enamored and focused on the currency of money 
that they mm-hmm. forgot that there are three other currencies. There are four currencies that we exchange. And those other currencies are as valuable, if not more valuable, than money itself. And the currencies are time, energy, information, and then, of course, money. Right? So I'm in books. When we, sell, when we try to help our clients sell a book, you have, to be, you have to consider what currency the customer is going to spend. Yes, $20 to buy a book is a currency, but that's not the biggest currency that, that your uh, reader is going to spend. Which of the four currencies do you think that they, they spend the most on? I would say the time. Um, to say. Right. If I'm asking, I'm asking you to spend four, six, eight, ten hours of your life on reading a book, time that you will never get back, right? How much intimacy and trust of me do you need to have to invest that amount of time? I have to have Quite a lot. A <laughs> yes, yeah, you have to have a lot. So it's inappropriate um, from a sales process standpoint to ask, um, if you have an author on a TV show and ask the the viewers to go for five minutes to go buy buy and read the book, it, right? You you don't have enough trust for me. I I I like what you had to say for five minutes, but now you're asking me to spend eight hours reading your book. That's that's an inappropriate ask of currency. It's a, too big of a jump. So what we look at is what is the micro steps in building trust with your uh with your with your customer now the 12 steps range from eye to body as you mentioned which is mm-hmm. i see you a beautiful woman all the way through step 12 which is sex now the, all, all and, and there's literally 11 steps in between all of the steps right. are necessary at creating the foundation of a relationship but you literally go from eye to body i see a beautiful woman through 10 other steps to get to that final action that seals the the intimacy what direct marketers do what advertisers did back in the uh, me cycle in the 60s 70s 80s and 90s was to try to get to 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 get the client in bed to get their money as quickly as possible basically um the old model of marketing would be the equivalent in in the real world of being a pickup artist right the point of a pickup artist <laughs> yeah. is just to get the person in bed. That's it. They don't want a long-term relationship. They're not looking for it. All they want is a is that long-term is that short-term transaction. In business, the direct marketers and advertisers that did the same thing in a me cycle were pickup artists. They wanted they 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 were worried about the sex, but their their ultimate goal was money. So they were they were wanting one night stands. They wanted to get into the, their customers' pants to pull out their wallet and grab their money, right? It's the it's the same. They wanted to skip steps of intimacy to get to the money. And in a me cycle, that's okay because individuals want to be pushed to be bigger and better than who they are. But it violates the values in a we cycle. It violates mm-hmm. what customers are looking for. It doesn't allow for intimacy and community to be built. And so what happens is. Because in business, we money ultimately is the lifeblood of a business. Um, it's how we, we pay our employees and our vendors and, and, and run our operations. Um, it's easy to get caught up in the, the um, pickup artist uh, mindset to be able to get to that transaction as quickly as possible to, get to, to be able to get to the money. The problem with that is that... The, um, Again, going back to the 12 steps of intimacy, if you skip more than one step in the process, any two steps or more, the probability of that being a long-term relationship is less than 5%. So wow. <clears throat> building long-term relationship versus short-term transaction are in direct corollary conflict with each other. They are in opposition to each other. You cannot do both. So if you sell a can of soup, well, that's fine. You can you can do transactionary marketing and sales tactics because you're not worried about the long-term relationship with your customer. It, you're just selling a can of soup. You're gonna, it's going to be consumed and, and done. But if you're a thought leader like my clients or like you or like me, uh, your audience wants to, they need to build trust with you. They don't want to be sold. They need the selling might be part of the the, the relationship building process, but they they want to be able to trust you, right? 
And so Absolutely. what happens is in business and marketing, we are not self-aware of what we did in building our interpersonal relationship with our significant other or others to be able to be aware of how to apply um, what we do in an intimate environment, in a non-intimate environment like marketing and advertising. So literally, if, you, if your listeners are in or have had a long-term uh, partnership with someone, they, um, interpersonal partnership, they have gone through these same 12 steps. At the, found, the probability is that they went through these, these same 12 steps. That's not to say that transactions can't be fun, that a one-night stand couldn't be fun, but if you want a long-term relationship, you can't start that relationship with that one-night stand. It has to be based upon core fundamentals uh, to mm-hmm. be able to have that long-term relationship. And same is true in building business relation, uh, relationships with your customers. You've got to do the things that are necessary to build those uh, to, to build that trust. And so by taking the 12 steps of intimacy, what we're able to do is intentionally walk through the micro steps in business that we mm-hmm. do naturally in the real world that we, that we don't n- normally think about. Right, so step one is eye to body. I see a beautiful woman. I define if I'm interested or not. Step twelve is sex. Step eight is kissing. It takes eight steps to go from I see a beautiful woman to the point where both parties have the right to be able to kiss each other. Right, but in business, we want to we want the customer to see us and then we want them to kiss us, <laughs> or, <laughs> or or worse. Right, that's 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 what we want. But, it's, but it, 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 human psychology doesn't work that way. And so when we look at step one, eye to body, it's the same in business. It's being seen by your customer in an environment that you do not control, right? If, I'm, uh, if right now I'm on your show, the only right. thing that I can con- con- control is how I present myself to you. Your listeners are wherever they are. They're having, they have the experience before listening to the show that they did. They have an experience going on around them right now, and they will have an experience after they hear this, the show. I have no control over that. They are seeing right. me. It's an eye-to-body opportunity, or, or, or voice-to-body, but, they, but they're virtually seeing me, and they are evaluating and grading whether or not they agree, whether or not they, they think that my philosophy is full of crap, or they agree with it. Right, they are they are evaluating me, and I have no control over that evaluation. The same thing would be true if uh, I did a Google search. If I if I, I need to find a, a a a jeweler in in Calgary, Alberta, the the only thing that the the, the jewelers that pop up can do is control their result. They can't control any of the other results that are going on around them. Um, so it, it, it's. In terms of marketing, step one, I to body is being seen in an environment that you don't control. If I see a, if I see you a beautiful woman at an event, I don't um, you don't control how I see you. You don't control right. from what angle. You don't control my response or my reaction. The only thing that you can control is how you present yourself. What are you wearing? How are you sitting? How are you how are you presenting yourself? That's it. You can you can control that, yep. nothing else. Right, first so impression. Eye to body, it is its mm-hmm. first impression, and it's and it's how and where you're being seen. Step two is eye to eye, right? The 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 customer sees you, and then they feel seen by you. Now, in mm-hmm. the real world, this is kind of where the the concept of flirting comes in, because what we're dealing with here again is the exchange of currencies, and if I were if I were to look at you and stare at you for ten minutes straight, and you don't know me, even if you'd been attracted to me at step one, um, you're going to get freaked out because I don't have yep. permission, Creepy. permission to look at you for that long. <laughs> yeah. Now I do with my fiance because we have a deeper relationship, but I don't have permission from you to do that, right? Um, so what happens is. Again, and this is where flirting comes in. I look at you, you look away. You look back at me, and then I look away. Right? We, and this is where we go back and forth with that micro exchange of currency, a little bit of energy, a little bit of, of information. Right? We're, we're judging 
whether or not we have interest to move forward. In business, you, um, again, marketing is um, done not in intimate environments. So if at step one, you're being seen in a Google search and you are actually not only answering the stated but unstated question of the consumer who's done the search, um, and they then click over to your, your website, your landing page, which I prefer to use blog posts in this case, um, if you understand your customer and you understand their unstated felt need, why they did the search to begin with, you can fully help them to feel seen by you by having the right information on that page. Mm -hmm. Right? So you want your customer to feel seen by you while they are looking at you. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, the whole platform of how websites are even built now is, has shifted. Uh, right. You, have, you do so, have more blogs and information. Well, it's it's all about information. It's not about you know. It's not about squeeze pages and what I call douchebag marketing. It's about <laughs> respecting your customer. One one of the things that most people don't realize is that, and and this is true in publishing. Publishers um, look not at the size of an email database. They look at the size of the author's blog readership. Why do you suppose that is? Because that's the, that's the two-way communication. That's uh, where they know that they're impacting and reaching. And, and you have... Well, if it, well, even more than that, even more than that, um, how, when you, how many things do you sign up for with your junk email address? Uh, not many, <laughs> but you do. But you uh, have a junk email address, right? That that yeah, you want yeah. something on the other side that you use your junk email address to to go and get to get that thing. Even if right. you don't do it often, you you, you do do it. Um, most of us do, uh, at least a little bit. Um, the thing is, is that emails, even if you're you sign up for something that you want, the emails that you get. And I don't know if you sign up for Roy Williams' Monday Morning Memo or if you get the the our uh, midweek missive from the uh, or the, the our pendulum time our We Times uh, newsletter, but I bet you don't read all of our articles. Uh, or if you do, you're the exception. Well, uh, Roy Williams is one of the most brilliant writers you'll ever read, and I only read about a third of his content that I get in my email. And I and I'm right. I'm his ghostwriter and everything else. Be, but because email is passive, meaning it can go in my inbox. It doesn't mean I'm going to read it, right? It's it's passive. But if I'm on your blog, I'm choosing to be on your blog. I have actively chosen to go over to your blog. My action means that I am a more active and engaged audience member. Yes. Does that make okay. sense? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So what we look at is the a relationship is not a one-way street. One party can't invest without the equal reciprocation of the other party. It has to go both ways. And what we're talking about in, in all of this is building relationships. So if, if, if a handsome man or woman were to be flirting with you and they were to walk up and kiss you, what would you most likely do? Get offended and, and walk away. <laughs> or you might smack him, and rightfully so. Yeah, but that, right? yeah, yeah, might go to might go to violence, but no, <laughs> I won't admit it. Well, on I'm not saying it has to, but the the initial like the shock of some stranger kissing you, and you, I mean, it, 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 the the reflective smack would would make a lot of sense because they just yes. jumped, they just jumped six steps to to, to kiss you. Like they you don't have enough currency between the two of you that's been invested. What after flirting? What would be a reasonable next step. A handshake or a, a conversation. Just right. to you want to have a conversation. Let's increase the, the, the currency or to increase the level of understanding each other. Just you have to build on I look at it as a spiral that you start with small and then you keep adding on or, or the scaffold approach of Continually adding on to the experience. Well, and that's and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about having enough respect for your customer to know what currency is the right currency to ask for, and in what quantities at the right 
place in that relationship building process. Right? If you ask for too much, you skip steps, you violate the ability to build relationships, and you become a pickup artist. Yeah, and I think that's in, in how I'm interpreting a lot of uh, the 12 steps and how you put it in, in various different places is that we as entrepreneurs, nonprofits, whoever uh, is listening, you need to actually map out a plan of your own 12 steps of building a relationship with your customers so that you can Absolutely. visually see that you're not skipping a step. You know, we, we actually call it scenario planning, right? It, it's mapping out and planning out. If you're, if you're in business, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's necessary. If you care about your audience, you respect them, and you want them to be lifetime clients and fans, you need to be able to know what are the different scenarios or journeys that okay. they're going to go yes. on to, to engage with you, right? And so the 12 steps is a... It doesn't necessarily express what the journey is, but it does express what currency is appropriate and how much of that currency is appropriate in different phases of the journey. Yes. Right? Uh, the, journey, mm -hmm. the, the, the journeys may be different one from another, but note, but note that no matter what, if you are early in the journey, you can't go from – from flirting from eye to eye to kissing. You've got to go to, to voice to voice, which is why mm -hmm. we like blog posts here because blog posts can link to social media and they allow for conversation on the blogs themselves, right? The engagement. And that's, right. That's a great point. Um, and what I want to do, to actually, I want to take a quick break right now. I need to get in my commercials. You know, I've got to pay the bills. Um, but also my show tip speaks directly to the points you're making about blog. So we're going to be back with Michael in about a minute and a half after we hear these commercial breaks. The Philanthropeneur Foundation. Build your capacity with our educational programs and professional services. Learn how to be a philanthropeneur. Maximize your social impact and maximize your revenue. Visit thephilanthropeneur.com or philanthropeneurfoundation.org to find services, resources, and training to launch, enhance, or improve your business or nonprofit strategy. While there, sign up to receive the Philanthropeneur Journal digital publication. Today's Philanthropeneur Show Tip. Yes, every week we, uh, well, every show we uh, present a show tip. And recently I read an article in Forbes.com and it listed 11 marketing trends to look for in 2015. I'm not going to go through all 11, but one in particular that's relevant for today's show is that transparency will become the most important tool of marketing. Consumers are going to continue to exert power and influence, and the idea of radical transparency is something that few brands are taking advantage of now, and most brands fight it. In 2015, the best brands won't be those with the best story or sort of made-up fictional stories, but those that will give an accurate and real time of what they are doing in the interest of the consumer at any given time. And noting what we just said on the show, blogs can do that. They are real, raw, and relevant. The Philanthropeneur Journal, a quarterly digital publication reaching over 600,000 entrepreneurs and nonprofits. Get targeted exposure to reach your ideal customer with our unique Ads for a Cause, where 50% of the fee goes to support our nonprofit training and services programs. Together, we can make a difference create impact, and build capacity. Visit thephilanthropeneur.com, marketing ads tab for all the details. Mention this show and get a 10% discount. Okay, we're back with Michael R. Drew uh, on the Philanthropeneur Radio Show, and we're going to continue our conversation of 12 intimacy steps of intimacy. Um, we have about nine minutes left, so what are some key things that we need to focus on for these last few minutes, Michael? Well, I mean, really and truly, the, the big point of what we uh, of what we're talking about here has to deal with um, 
the the respect of your customer, respect, knowing who they are and respecting them enough to be able to allow them to build trust with you and, and engage with you and build a real relationship. The 12 steps is a model for being able to do that as part of what you uh, as part of mapping out your customer's journey. Um, so it, it, as we go through it, the step three is voice to voice because it makes sense to have a conversation. Blogging would be mm-hmm. one example of that. Uh, step four, you, from talking, the two parties now want to exchange physical energy to see if there's a synergistic, uh, a, a synergistic attraction to each other. And this is done through a, the step four, which is hand to hand. Right. This could be playing footsie mm-hmm. under the table. This could be, be me scooting my hand over and my small fi- my my small finger touching uh, your small finger. What, whatever it is, but it's that that first exchange of physical contact in business. This could be going from a blog post over to downloading a white paper or a report that doesn't require um, an opt-in, an e- a name, an email address but it simply is a download because what we're mm-hmm. asking our customer to do here is to spend more time and energy in exchange for the value that we're delivering. We're not looking to get an opt-in yet. Then at step five, when we get even more intimate, you go from hand to hand to hand to shoulder. So I go from holding your hand to pulling you in, pulling you closer to me and bring your body so that we can really see if there's more of that attraction and that, that energetic connection. And at a step five, we now have the right to ask for a phone number. We now have the right to ask for an opt-in if we're on, if we're online. We have the right to ask for a business card if we're you know in a live environment. Um, and at this point, we have the opportunity to start asking for uh, two or more forms of currency. Right? We can ask for time and energy. We can ask for time and information. We can ask for energy and information. Uh, money as a currency, it's not appropriate to ask until step eight, so you're aware. Okay. Um, and and what businesses in the B cycle try to do is go from steps two, three, or four, or even five, and skip immediately to money. Again, skipping steps of intimacy, not respecting the customer, just to be able to get to the the currency of money. Um, so you go from step five to step six. Which is if I have my my arm around your shoulder or uh, or and you're you're next to me, if I wanted to kiss you, pulling you in, which is step eight, pulling you in while you're on my side would be awkward and not an easy thing to do, right? I could do it, but right. you might bonk our foreheads and it wouldn't be fun. It wouldn't be the experience that we're we're both looking for. So what you, what the next step is is to position the other party in front of you and put your arm your hand on their waist. Again, each of these steps is communicating to the customer your intention, and conversely, they're communicating back to you what their intention is as well. And just like in the real world, the consumer, the customer, has the right to slow things down or to stop things, right? In a sales right. process, it, it, they, they, they just, let's get the money, and we're going to not let the person say no, and we're going to do whatever, whatever it takes to get the money. That's a disrespectful way of building, a, uh, of, of selling and of, of and it, and it stops the ability to build a relationship. So what we want to do is make sure that we maintain the the ability to build relationship and res- and, by, and we do this by giving the respect to our customer. Now, if the customer wants to skip steps, if they want a one night stand, if they want a transaction, they we 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 don't need to turn them down. We'll take them. But what's important to note is if they come in. From a transactional standpoint, they have a transactional need. They're going to treat you from. They're going to treat you transactionally. They're not likely yes. going to be even if you deliver what you say or you deliver more than you say. They're probably not going to come back. They're probably not going to be repeat business and repeat customers because they came in transactionally. They you you may have desired a relationship, but they didn't. They wanted that transaction, and you gave it to them. You made the money, but you, you limit your relationship. There is going to be limited. So if they come in that way, can you go back as as the business and and still walk through those steps to to make only, them go home? It's their choice. Only they can go okay. through them. They're there. Okay. They're available, right? They're there. They, they mm-hmm. have to to make the choice that that's what they want. So it's possible, okay. but it's very difficult. And we okay. as business owners really don't have the control over that. 
right? Uh, it's just yeah. think about it. You, you you meet someone, you thought you'd like to have a a long term relationship with them. They push things too fast. You end up having a one night stand, um, and you still want that long term relationship, and they don't. It, it, convincing the other person to to change is a hard thing to do, and yeah. that, it's almost a waste of time. So you, you, <laughs> Yeah. So you can. So the goal is you have all of these twelve these twelve steps mapped out, so that so that you're showing the customer the respect. You don't turn someone down if they want the transaction because money is still a valid currency. Um, you just simply recognize that, that the, those clients aren't going to be your long term raising fans. They're simply coming in to be a customer. Um, yes. So step step six is hand to waste the communication of what the intention is. And here, um, it's and this is a business model question, it's are you asking them to spend more time, more energy, or more information? As an example, we have a, I have a client who is a financial expert. And at step six, they do an online assessment of your financial situation. So you share a detailed amount of information and a bit of time to be able to uh, share that information with them. They don't sell at step six because it would be inappropriate for them to do so. Um, but they're asking for a, a lot of time. When you see product launches where they ask you to watch th- two or three or four videos, they're, the currency they're asking you to spend is time, right? The, mm-hmm. To consume that, to consume those videos, and usually in that case, it's a lot of time, and maybe an hour and a half to three hours of video content that they're asking for. So it's a significant amount of time investment. So you okay. have to define for your business at, at at each of these steps, I'll give some principles here, but what what currency is best for your customer based on your business model. Now, we're, we're down to about a minute and a half. <laughs> we're, we're getting down nice. to that wire. We're done. Um, well, I'll, I'll see if I can get to step eight because from there it moves hot and heavy. So step so step. Um, at step six, I can pull you in and kiss you, but again, it's still, still awkward. So step seven, the first time you're kissed is what we call hand-to-face. I put my hand on your face. And it's a really intimate action to do that. Um, we can ask for more time, energy, or information at that point. The uh, financial uh, expert that I, uh, that I mentioned a moment ago, he'll then jump on the phone and, do an, and evaluate live with the customer the information they filled out online at step seven. Step eight, we now have the opportunity to ask for money. We can ask for up to four hours of time. We can ask for up to $100 of cash. Uh, we mm-hmm. can, you know, we we can ask for a little bit more information. At step eight, uh, get the uh, financial company I mentioned will take the phone assessment and send back um, a suggestion as to what is needed and ask for more information. Step uh, when you go and from step eight, which is kissing, it, things move hot and heavy. Step nine is um, hand to body. Define that as you will. Now we have the right to ask our customers to spend eight hours of time, up to $500 in cash, uh, and, and to share more details. Down to step. Yeah, okay. we're bound down to 15 seconds. I'm just <laughs> letting you, because I have to give a couple more things in. Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, no worries. So from there, it's just, it's, just an ex- it's just an extension of what currency are you asking your customer to spend, time, energy, information, money. What happens in business is what I would urge your audience to be aware of. Most businesses want to go from steps one through three and skip to step eight, nine, or ten. Yes. And you, what's important and what's missed is mapping out all of those steps that lead up to that first sale at step eight. You know, and I really encourage them to go and explore this more. I mean, this has been so great, Michael. I, I, you're the author of Pendulum, founder of Promote a Book. Um, I, I will have on my website site uh, how to reach and reach out to you and to learn more about you to start building that relationship. I'm encouraging all my uh, listeners to tune in March 18th as we welcome Sean McCullough of Young Eagles Entrepreneur. And it has been great. And I will see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Philanthropeneur Radio Show, hosted by Dr. Victoria Boyd. Get involved. Follow us on Facebook and other social media outlets. If you wish to share comments or suggestions or appear as a guest on our show, visit www.thephilanthropeneur.com. Contact Victoria Boyd. Email her at thboyd at thephilanthropeneur.com. The Philanthropeneur Radio Show is a production of and sponsored by the Philanthropeneur Foundation, a 501c3 tax-deductible organization.